Welcome back to the Global Supply Chain Week. We're excited to bring the freight and logistics industry together to talk about the developments on the global stage and how that's impacting modern supply chains. Here is someone that understands the importance of global supply chains and what they mean to our country. Bob Corker is here with me today. Welcome, Bob. Craig, good to be with you. Love to see what's happening here. It's an exciting time, not just in Chattanooga here at Freightways, but just what's going on around the world. Uh, I think uh, oftentimes there's a lot of news and noise out there, but people uh, miss the importance of globalization, what it means for our country. You spent a lot of time in government as well as in the private sector. You've seen the intersection of that. I'd love to get your perspective on what is happening around globalization and what that means for our country. Sure. Um, well, look, I, uh, uh, as you mentioned, I was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and had some great experiences there. It was a great privilege to serve, but you realize how interconnected the world is, how respected the United States is and what we do impacts so many people. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, we just can't, we, we can't isolate ourselves under ourselves. This, this, this recent talk over the last three or four years is just not realistic for our country to, to thrive, to survive, uh, to make sure we're always on the edge. We're competing with everyone around the world and therefore we, and we need parts and pieces from around the world, which is obviously what's made uh, shipping and logistics such a strong, strong uh, part of our economy right now. So, um, yes, um, and let's face it, international things that are happening internationally affect people right here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as you know well. And I'm thankful there's a company like yours doing what you're doing, making sure people understand what's happening in that regard, especially as you mentioned before this uh, with what's happened with COVID. I mean, people have been really focused on, on their supply chains. What do you think in a post we're currently in a COVID world, but we do have light at the end of the tunnel. What do you think the world looks like as it relates to America's position in that? Yeah, I think we've, uh, you know, obviously forget, you know, the, the vaccines and all of that. I mean, that's going to be in the rearview mirror soon. And, and uh, obviously we're, we're thankful that we've had such great pharmaceutical companies who've risen to the occasion. I think we're going to be incredibly competitive. I do. And, uh, you know, companies like yours and others have found uh, more efficient ways of operating. I still think people are going to be in physical spaces. I do. I think the culture, it's hard for a growing company to have the kind of culture that you want to have. I'm affiliated with a company that's global right now. And, you know, you, you, you've got to make sure you have that one-on-one -on -one contact. But I think, uh, I think it's made us, it's, it's, it's leapt us ahead many years as it relates to us focusing on efficiency and how we communicate. And, you know, this was a big step forward, but, you know, now meeting through Zoom and all of those kind of things, uh, people realizing that they don't have to travel uh, five hours to the other coast to meet with people. It, look, I think, I think it's going to be even more dynamic than it's ever been. I really do. And I think we're well positioned for that. You spent decades before you're uh, in government, you spent decades in real estate. There's a lot of conversation about commercial real estate yeah. as well as residential, but they seem to be going in different paths. What is your view on the future of commercial real estate? So I think, I think in markets like uh, Chattanooga, where we are today, uh, where it's easy to commute, you know, you're not looking at coming in an hour from Connecticut like you would be in Manhattan or, Manhattan or a place like that. I think we're going to do just fine, and I think people are going to migrate to places like this. They already are. The, obviously, the tax bill of 2017 with, you know, the SALT provisions are causing people to want to come to places like Tennessee and other places in the South where taxation is a little bit different. So. I think I think that uh, office real estate here will will do fine. Retail, I'm in I'm in you know I'm an investor in some retail properties also, especially the the ones that are that are not enclosed malls. I think they're going to thrive with the right tenant mix. But you have to be careful, much more careful with commercial real estate than in the past. On the other hand, as you mentioned, I mean residential. I'm also investing in some of that and uh, God, it's just so dynamic right now. It's incredible, isn't it? And people who were in apartments uh, now because of all that's happened, they want a yard, they want a place for a dog. So now the rental market for single family uh, housing has just taken off. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, again, I think real estate is still a great place to be. R rates have been low. We'll see with all that's happening, especially this next stimulus, uh, which to me is a, a little over the top, maybe way over the top, especially where we are today. But we'll see where where rates go. I mean, at the end of the day, with, with the 10-year Treasury at 115 or 120, there's still, you know, it's still cheap money, but as things begin to creep up, uh, it's going to have a big effect on real estate. You think it, if they do, if it creeps up. Do you think we'll see inflation? I mean, do you think with all this money? You know, we've been trying to create, I remember having uh, Ben Bernanke in my office, uh, you know, we had QE1, QE2, QE3, and everybody was worried about inflation. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, our biggest threat for a big, a big part of the time since 2008 when the financial crisis has been deflation, right? I mean, that's really been, we've been doing everything we can as a country and actually the world, you know, the developed countries have been doing everything they can to try to create inflation, right? To, to keep deflation from actually uh, harming our economies and so, I think it's it's you know it feels like to me there's beginning to be some upward pressure. I am certainly don't have the uh, you know I don't have the uh, the vision to know exactly. No one does where it's going, but it feels like we're beginning to have it. But again, things are so efficient now. Yeah, I mean, we can do so much with so little, right? Um, and I think that that never and 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 we're learning to do it even more so now, right? I mean. My office, the things we're able to do from my office around the world dealing with people is just incredible. So, um, I mean, a, a little inflation, um, certainly at least reaching the target, you know, that's been set of 2%, uh, certainly uh, could be very beneficial to our country, but, but we'll see. Um, I mean, it's astounding when you think, so freight rates have gone up anywhere from 60 to 100%. Some, you know, international containers are up 200% from places like China and, and, and elsewhere. And yet there doesn't seem to be a ton of pressure. And with all the money flooding the system, we're still not seeing rapid inflation. And so, but at some point that seems like that, that has to change. But is technology, is the cloud, mobile phones, is that accelerating so much of the economic and innovation economy that it's offsetting these increases in the physical? Yeah, it feels to me like uh, that that has to be the factor that's been unaccounted for and has blown every model that's been out there as it relates to where we ought to be, if you will, as it relates to, to inflation. So, so again, um, I wouldn't, we've had a little tick up recently in the 10 year treasury. Um, uh, is that, is that a, is that a pattern? Is that a trend or is that just a, a blip? I, I don't know. I don't know. So and obviously, and obviously what happens as it relates to, you know, uh, quote the pandemic over the course of time can affect that too. I think, I think there is some, in spite of all the money, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I spent a lot of time with Jeffries, uh, and God, God, every Monday morning on our reports, the money that's flowing <laughs> into the market, it's just, I mean, you know, they're just taking orders, as is, as is all entities that are helping companies like yours and others with capital. So um, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to believe we are where we are. Right yeah, now. valuations continue to go up. We see it in our own business. We're getting calls from investors uh, that want to invest. The challenge is we don't, we don't need as much capital as we did because our business is scaling and growing efficiently. It's an interesting time. When you talk to startups, you've, you and I talked before we got on air about the SPAC situation, what's happening there. It's interesting because as a founder of a startup, it's very tempting to take more capital, but you also look at the valuations and you say, is this sustainable? And so as you think about uh, what's happening in the broader economy and the markets, do you think these valuations are sustainable? Do you think that we've reached a new plane in the economy where where this stuff is going to continue to grow? Or, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I got very conservative personally. You know, uh, even before the pandemic hit, and uh, and I was just continued to, to roll on. So the market has just been phenomenal on the on the spacs. Um, you know, they um, obviously they're bidding up prices. 
uh, I, I will say that, you know, two years ago, SPAC was almost a dirty word, and it has been an easy way to, to go public. I had a conversation today with somebody that you would know, the country would know well, calling him about a company that he wanted to acquire that, that Jeffries is, is, uh, is representing. It's in a really unique market. And, and what, what I am seeing happen with SPACs, and in this particular case, uh, the interest of the SPAC and the sponsors and the companies and the investors, both in the, in the company, in the, in the SPAC, but also the pipe that comes on after. They, the SPAC is, it, SPACs are getting much more sophisticated, much more aligned with interest mm -hmm. uh, for someone like yourself. Uh, and so I think as they mature, there's going to be less friction, if you will, uh, less promote, yep. less dilution for somebody like you. And I, I think as that occurs, they're going to be com become even more appealing for people going public versus taking the risk of getting out there and what's the real range of your stock price. So uh, as that happens, there won't be as much money made mm -hmm. on the SPAC side. Uh, but I think there'll be greater certainty for folks with less friction, and uh, and it could well, uh, you know, it's bringing in a whole new era. I mean, you know, let's face it, uh, the exchanges are highly focused on them. It's a big part of our business at Jefferies, and and uh, and uh, uh, you know, it would also be a great time uh, if you're a, if you're a company. The valuations, as you mentioned, here's here's what you know. You were saying, uh, well, should I sell to a SPAC or should I should I go public? I don't need the money right now. Um, I do think the one thing companies ought to be doing is borrowing as much as they can right now. Our our uh, leveraging business is just going through the roof, and the spreads on high yield debt versus you know standard debt is very narrow. So any company today. That uh, that wants that thinks they may need to take on debt should be doing it right now. It's never been like it so is but today. One of the things, the challenges with that is equity prices. When when a company has a lot of debt on its balance sheet, is that depresses the valuation uh, in some cases. How, how would you answer that? If or how do you think? How should someone think of that? Well, I mean, you're a company that you know. We, we talked a little bit about your financial situation, and I'm a small investor in the company, and I'm glad to hear uh, you are where you are. Uh, I mean, if you don't need money, uh, certainly leveraging up makes no sense. But if you're a company that sees in 18 months uh, you're going to be needing some some debt, now's the time to get it. Or a lot of people are even paying a penalty and going ahead and refinancing and um, getting a longer term and a lower rate. So if you have debt today, let me, you know, if, if you have debt today, uh, you know, you know, everyone should be looking at where they are and uh, certainly uh, refinancing that because, the, again, the markets, especially on uh, uh, on the high, what would have been high yield debt, the market there is just incredible. Yeah, it, I, a lot of our audience, being transportation, warehouse operators, and such, have a lot of debt. So I think it's uh, th these tend to be asset heavy businesses. So it's good for them to hear and be encouraged to go look at those options. Something I want to talk about that's getting a lot of play is the U.S. currency. The the concept that this is a, you know this is a reserve currency and our status as we print more of it or produce more of it and increase the money supply could put that at risk put put that at risk what are your what's your thoughts on that well um, you know first of all you've got other countries that you know like china for instance that you know everybody comes into every conversation that you know over time um, they hope to you know, they hope their countries will evolve to a place where they have also, quote, a currency that, that you know, is, is, a, is a dominant currency. And over time, that likely will happen. Uh, I, don't say, I don't want to say more dominant than the United States, but when we, one of the things that, that as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, you know, obviously our nation doesn't want to enter into wars unnecessarily, obviously. Um, you, you don't want to be in a conflict that you can avoid. And so what we do, obviously, is we put sanctions in place all the time. 
And, and you know, that's our, that's our sort of a default way of dealing with, comp- you know, countries. We do it with Iran. We're doing it with, you know, we're doing it with Russia and places. And the more we use that sanction, uh, the more people are going to be looking at ways around, uh, you know, our currency and, and our reserves uh, status. And, uh, and so it really undermines us. And, of course, as other countries grow and prosper, uh, they're in a competitive place. And then you've got these, these, these payment systems in general that are just dynamic and changing. And uh, to me, that's exciting. It's very Are you talking about cryptocurrency. Yes, I mean it's amazing. And yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing that's happening. Uh, the swings in it, uh, you know, certainly uh, <laughs> would make me nervous. But, but uh, look, I, I think that we have to be careful as a country. We're not managing our fiscal issue, uh, matters. We're, you know, 100 percent debt to GDP at a time when we don't have a crisis. Last time we were here is in World War II. Neither party, neither party. Uh, seems to care much about fiscal issues anymore. I mean, it's like, you know, send the helicopter out with cash. Uh, it's like we're outbidding each other. You know, right before the election, you had a uh, then Republican president outbidding Democrats on how much money we were going to send out to the public. So there's the, the lack of fiscal control eventually will be a problem for us. And uh, I know that everybody talks about this new monetary theory where it doesn't matter how much debt you have. And I'm beginning to hear people uh, talk about, uh, you know, such things as, well, we'll just do away with the debt and print money. And, you know, uh, we're moving into to a place where, uh, you know, we're threatening our status as it relates to, to being the, the, world's, uh, the world's place to go. Now, another topic that's getting a lot of attention is immigration. Uh, it's it's a, obviously a very polarizing uh, uh, topic, but a lot of countries like Canada have developed ways of recruiting H-1B, v, what would be the equivalent of the H-1B visa, are the knowledge workers. Do you think we'll see some reform there or your thoughts on that? I hope so. You know, we, we missed an opportunity. We've missed so many opportunities. In t- 2013, there was an opportunity to do something that was bipartisan. Um, I was on the bill. Actually, my amendment on the Senate floor is is what caused the bill to pass the Senate. The House wouldn't take it up at the time because the it was too, devices, too divisive at the time. Uh, then there was an opportunity uh, back in 2018 to do something that was a step forward um, but you know it was squandered and instead people realize they get so much political mileage out of the immigration issue that sometimes it's better to fight look from from a political standpoint and from their perspective uh, I don't think so look we 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 you know uh, have an incredible talent in your country uh, uh, is a lifeblood for growth, right? And, and, and when you don't have the ability to do that, when there are specific needs that companies have that cannot be met here, you're basically stifling the, com- uh, the economy, you're hurting everyone's standard of living. So I do hope, I will say our immigration system has not been based enough on the skills that people can provide to help our economy. It hasn't been. It's been more of a quota system, and and uh, I do think that as we reform immigration, we should look to reforming it in such a way that we have the ability to attract the kind of talent in our country that will help it grow, uh, and that would be a major reform for us. It would take us in a positive direction. Yeah, I think as a as a company that hires a lot of engineers, the one of the things we're looking at is, is nearshoring or offshoring it because the, just the cost of talent for some of the projects. And I think in a world where, in a work from home world, you can get talent anywhere, which puts that Silicon Valley model or tech model at risk. Yeah. So, you know, you, we both have been talking about all that's happened since March of last year with the way people are doing business. You're doing business in a totally different way. Uh, than you were uh, nine, nine, 10, 11 months ago. But if you think about the fact that our immigration system is broken, uh, we are having difficulty because of that and levels that are set, quota levels, we're having difficulty getting talent into our country uh, that's, that is needed. So 
many companies, you know, it's easy to talk to people on oh, the video now. It's, people are offshoring, they already were doing. So you actually, by having a, such a limited immigration policy like we have, you're actually creating jobs in other countries. Now, you know, these people, as you know, I mean, many of the people that, that you're getting venture funding from, these are people who came to this country, immigrated to this country, right? They did well. Now they're in farms that understand what you're doing. And so, you know, we want those types of people here. They're going to create companies, right, that are going to create great, great paying jobs for Americans. And, and where we are right now is we're hindering ourselves in that regard. I'd much rather have that person that you need located in Chattanooga, Tennessee or someplace else in the country than I would for you to be offshoring. I mean, all of that, again, is, is you know, it is talent that you need. But I'd love to have those people here creating great jobs, creating thickness in that quality. I mean, you and I both know that, that uh, when you have a thickness of talent, it's not just a thin pool, a thickness of talent in your country or in a particular part of the country, um, you, you really explode. Here in our city, your family, so many others, we've got a thickness in logistics knowledge, right? And so we're continuing to thrive. There's all kind of companies that are starting here that are dealing with logistics. Well, it's, it's like that in tech. It's like that in pharmaceuticals. It's like that in, in every industry. And uh, again, if we don't have an appropriate immigration system, we're just, we're hindering ourselves. Well, that capital just gets recycled. The knowledge gets recycled. Uh, that's what's made Chattanooga so special is that when Access America sold to Coyote and then UPS, is you had all of these uh, young, relatively young people who had a little bit of capital and went out and started all of these other freight operations. And it's created this really vibrant ecosystem here in Chattanooga. And I think it's a bit of model that's helped us grow because we're able to pull in talent from the community. But one of the things that's been challenging as we grow, we've, it's, it's more difficult now to find talent, particularly in certain types of skills, data science and engineering, because there's a limit. That's right. That's right. So hopefully that will be addressed. Do you think that brand America has been damaged because of some of the inconsistencies of foreign policy over the last couple of years? No question. I mean, it's no question. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so unnecessary. I mean, you know, I'll just give a good example. If you look at NATO and what we actually have done on the ground over the last four years, We've actually strengthened NATO. I mean, you know, we've with our troop presences, the rhetoric, though, uh, that just, can, you know, demeans uh, purposely sticking a stick in people's eyes um, has been very damaging. This, the whole sort of uh, coddling, if you will, of uh, non-democratic leaders uh, just... Uh, it's it, it's it's hurt us, and I tell you what has hurt us tremendously is uh, what happened on January 6, where you have those images. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and you know, it was amazing to me to go to these other countries and see how everything was focused on the United States of America. Everything. It's unbelievable how. I wish every American could have had the experience I had to see how much in high esteem we're held and how people look to us as an example and how, the, you know, they stop what they're doing to, to talk and see you. Well, uh, yes, there is a big focus on the United States. And so when you see people assaulting the Capitol, climbing through windows, people losing their lives, and one of the branches of government, Congress, um, it, it has a chilling effect and people, you know, we've always been out there, you know, trying to champion democracy and making sure that we do what we can relative to human rights. And then they're sitting there on television watching, watching our capital be assaulted, watching a president basically for months tell untruths about how an election can be overturned, hardworking Americans believing that that's hard for me to but we had so many americans that believed that congress could overturn an election or a vice president could overturn an election and the example that we have set both 
uh, civic civic understanding, people not even understanding that that's not the way it works. It cannot happen. But to also see uh, this this beacon of democracy uh, having happened, uh, having what happened to it, um, yeah, it's it's damaged us tremendously. It's it's and especially these fledgling preg these these fledgling democracies that we would visit and we'd you know want to make sure the elections were taking place properly i remember being in herat afghanistan the first time they had a vote and and at four o'clock in the morning seeing women out there who do all the work in afghanistan so they were voting it early in the morning so they could go back and cook meals and get kids off to school and that kind of thing and just how aspirational the whole thing was, but for them to be able to see what happened in this country uh, is incredibly damaging to us. And just the, the whole issue of, you know, breaking down alliances unnecessary, it just, unnecessarily, just what was the point? I mean, some, yes, but just to do it, to do it, to show that you can, um, very damaging to our country. It'll take, and let me say this, they know we have elections every four years. And so, so you have a president now. I didn't vote for either. I didn't vote for, uh, I didn't vote for President Biden. He's a friend of mine. I've known him. I served on the committee with him. He, he was chairman. I became chairman. I worked with him when he was vice president. I, I couldn't vote for our, our, our president at the time just because of his conduct. And, and, and even though many of his policies I liked, um, but uh, um, I... Uh, People realize we have elections every four years, and we could well be back in the place where we're, you know, January 20th. We could be back in that place again in four years. So it's going to be difficult for a new president to try to reestablish those alliances, and people believe that it's going to be permanent, right? Because we've had such a whipsaw. Mm -hmm. well, how, do, how does that damage? business, the business relations, the community that's tuning in to this particular uh, uh, conference are concerned about the stability of the global supply chain and what it means for their business. But if Brand America is damaged, that very well puts their businesses at risk. So, you know, it, it, it'd be very difficult to go from here to here and say this is the cause and effect. But the fact is that uh, America... Uh, has been the leader of the world. Uh, we've been unipolar since, you know, since 1989. It's been us, right? And um, and when and and when we speak, when we speak about free enterprise, when we speak about you know competition being appropriate, not mercantilism. When we talk about trade, we talk about all those kind of things. Uh, and when we are the world leader, we, we know well, that's our place. I mean, Republicans and Democrats for years have embraced both sides of the aisle that America's role in the world is to be that leader. It doesn't mean we're in conflict all the time with other countries, but we're the leader. And when that is tarnished over time, over time, it has a corrosive effect on the systems that, that our companies rely upon to make things work. It, it erodes those systems, right? And then you have, so here you have China, you know, a lot of countries, a lot of companies are looking at, or countries are looking at China. They do trade, maybe they don't like some of the things that they do, but some of them are finding them in their own mind to be more reliable, right? And so, and then their system, which is not, let's face it, not near as beneficial to our companies, uh, the kinds of rule of law that we embrace. Um, so again, I can't say that A to B, boom, four years, this is, but I can say that over a long period of time, it, it is corrosive to our leadership. It's corrosive to the system that our companies rely upon, the free enterprise system that we embrace, the rule of law. Uh, and if it goes on for a long time, uh, we will feel it. Yeah, well, we've course corrected, so there's some positive developments there. Hopefully, we can rebuild those confidence. I think ultimately, commerce does win out. We've seen uh, a lot of surge of products into our economy. Consumers are spending a lot of money. Uh, for you know the freight industry, it's actually an exciting time. I think 
the logistics industry has been on the front line of whether it's delivering products to homes or, or refilling grocery stores for toilet paper and, and medical devices. I think the, the, the supply chain has, has shown it to be quite resilient. But one of the things that we noticed is that private businesses did an exceptional job, whereas government didn't do an exceptional job. And I'm curious, what, where do you think the failure was? Was it a? Yeah, so I, you know, um, uh, I mean, it's amazing even today as we sit here and um, just the differences in states around us, right? I mean, some mm -hmm. states Richard are doing Jackson, well. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's just amazing. And the first rollout here was mm -hmm. just unbelievable. So, um, you know, I, I do think a challenge to democracy um, is related to some of the things we were talking about earlier. I mean, the world moves so rapidly, right? I mean, we can, you and I can make things happen with no assistant. Uh, we can, I mean, it's amazing how you can make things happen today and how quickly it happens. And you got social media now that's, that's a part of the sort of the undercurrent. Uh, as that affects democracy, democracy is slow and and it 's cumbersome, and government is big, and you know the private sector 's always going to be far 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 more more nimble mm -hmm. um, and it 's a challenge and you know if you look at people 's faith today and, and I hate to say it in our government and democracy um, it 's on the decline because it is you know i 've dealt a lot with Chinese, my Chinese interlocutors, people that had my job in, in China. And, and you know what they say, Craig, and they believe it. They, they look at us, democracy's clumsy, you've taken all points of view, you have to pass bills, um, you know, you have to have bipartisanship to make things happen in a very polarized society which we have today. They look at their model and they, they'll just flat tell you, look, we are on the ascendancy. We're a single party system. Uh, we make decisions and they happen. Uh, and we are going to surpass you as a country because your governance system is not adequate to meet the needs of the day. Now, I, I don't agree with that. I think that we all Americans and those who Western countries that adopt, that have Western values, we, gotta, we have to do a better job. Okay, we've got we to take the shirts and skins mentality out of this and realize we are a country that need collectively to move ahead. But, you know, the Chinese feel like that's not going to happen. That their system, they can address things quickly. You saw how they responded to COVID there. Um, I mean, it was, it was instantaneous. So we're freedom. We, we believe in freedom. We believe in freedom of movement. Um, you know, it, we're a republic. So uh, we have challenges, um, and it's one of the frustrations about being in government um, is, uh, you know, we could do things a lot better. There's a lot of impediments to making that happen, uh, and when it happens, people suffer. Well, Bob, really appreciate you being here. What is next for you? I don't know. I'm really enjoying this period of time. I'm, I'm uh, you know, as a business person, I, I served on... Uh, a public company board, uh, you know, that you're very fond of, I know, uh, and some others. I'm back in business now, um, back in my community. I'm immersed myself here, um, and I, I'm highly focused on, you know, stepping up my game as it relates to business. I, you know, I had two really great runs uh, as a young man, and then in an interim in between some public service it was my best run, actually, and and uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy building companies. I enjoy the effect you have on employees when you've got a dynamically growing company, the way they look at their future. Um, and I want to continue doing that. So, Well, thank you so much for coming in, being a part of this event, as well as being an investor. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Best thank wishes you. to you. And stay tuned for more content. We've got a lot coming your way over the next couple of days talking about how global supply chains are dealing with the future and evolving in real time.